You know, abundance is our birthright. Abundance is our birthright. And everywhere you look, you see abundance. There's an abundance of leaves on the trees. There's an abundance of snow in the ground. There's an abundance of water in the universe. There's an abundance everywhere you go. And you and I have the ability to create an abundance. Now it's all in awareness. There's a marvelous inner world and it's operating in you. And the revelation of that world enables you to do anything and to attain and achieve anything within the bounds of nature. You can have all of whatever it is you want, but you have to earn it. Now, what would abundance be in your life? It all starts in our mind. The core of who you are is the universal mind. And its only purpose is to help you express your individuality. It's operating for you in the way you want it to. Every single one of us, no matter what your experience is up to this point, has the same power. You will attract whatever you need. Abundance. It's your birthright. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day three, session two in our abundance workshop. I'm Mikey Stiller, the Chief Operating Officer and Director of Marketing for the Proctor Gallagher Institute, your host for this week. And I am so thrilled for this session specifically. The next 19 minutes, we've pulled a lesson of Bob teaching a lesson that had the most impact in my life. And I just know that you guys are going to absolutely love it and benefit from it. So make sure that you get out a piece of paper and a pen. You're going to want to take notes, set aside all distractions, fight the urge to answer any text messages or get on social media, answer any emails. Don't let anything distract you because this lesson could change everything for you. So for the next 19 minutes, give this lesson your undivided attention and I'll meet you on the other side. This is the key to everything you're ever going to do. It's how you see you. I one time read something, I think it was in Reader's Digest. I've seen it a couple of places since then. It says, I'm not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. But I am who I think you think I am. I'm going to run through that again, because I know you're, <laughs> you're playing with it in your mind. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am, but I am who I think you think I am. That is really a tricky one, but I believe it's true. I've spent a lot of time playing with that. Well, Scott, throw that first screen up. You know, I want you to look. 60 years is a long time to study anything. Thanks, Scott. Now, I have been studying what we're talking about here for 60 years. You can take it down now, Scott. Thank you. Leave it there. That's good. All right. Now, I'm going to go through some stuff, and I want you to really think. You've got to begin to think. If you've got a poor opinion of you, you're going to get poor results. When I met Ray Stanford, I had a very, very bad opinion of who I was. And, of course, I had good reason for having a bad opinion. The results were so bad. And I was letting the results control me. It never entered my mind that I was controlling those results. So you see, it was sort of a self-doom fulfilling cycle I was caught up in. But he got me studying this and he got me thinking. And I got to the point where I thought, well, I can't do that. Some of the things he was suggesting I do. I said, that's conceit. No, he says, not conceit. To have a real good opinion of yourself is just healthy conscious awareness of who you are. So. What we're talking about here is growth. We're talking about your growth. And we're talking about you living the way you really want to live. And if you're going to grow, if I'm going to grow, we've got to change. There's no other way about it. If I want to get better results, I've got to change. Okay? So let's look at this for a second. So far as we know, we get one life. We get one bite at the apple. And it's about lifestyle. But as you start thinking about it, no, it's about contribution. Well, yeah, it's about how we spend our days. 
I love the way I spend. I spend a good part of my day right here in the studio. And this, I've created an environment here that's it's just so absolutely phenomenal. I love it, you know. And you've got to get in an environment that's really good. I was reading something in a little um, magazine that I subscribed to. I was reading it last night. And it said, if you put a shark, a baby shark, in a tank, it'll grow up to nine inches. If you leave it in the ocean, it'll grow up to nine feet. It said the shark's growth is dependent on its environment. And that's the same with us. Our growth, to a large degree, is dependent on our environment. Well, we got one life, and it's all dependent on how we see ourself, our self-image. Now, there's three essential questions here that I want to pose. How does self-image impact my life? Well, the truth is it controls everything in my life. How is self-image formed? I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you something about self-image. If you have never seen it, it's very alarming almost. And then how is self-image changed? I'm going to talk about that. And Arash is going to talk about that. So let's take a look here. You've seen this. You're a mass of energy and a high speed of vibration. Now that's who you are if we strip you right down. Okay? And we're going to look at the mind and at paradigms. Now you'll say, well, Bob, you've gone through this before. You've got to understand I've gone through this every day now for 60 years. You can't go through this too often. Most people know very little about their mind. Well, I want you to take a look at your mind and your paradigm. Now, there was a doctor in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Truman Fleet, way back in 1934. He was very involved in the healing arts. He was very involved in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, metaphysical side. In other words, what's going on in our mind? And he said, the mind's not a thing. The mind is an activity. And nobody's ever seen the mind. Now, he said, what we're doing when we treat a person that's having a problem, we treat the body, we're treating a symptom. The problem, the cause of the problems and the mind. So he said, I'm going to draw a picture of the mind. And then he drew this picture. And he broke it into three parts. He said, let that make the conscious mind. That's the subconscious and this is the body. Now, I mentioned this on a previous call, but I'm going to tell you again, this is the most valuable idea I have ever learned. Because what it did, it brought order to my mind. I have a lot of books. I have a absolutely magnificent library. And uh, one of the greatest books on the mind is Dr. Joseph Murphy's Power of the Subconscious Mind. But it's all just words. There's no pictures. And you've got to get into pictures. You've got to have a picture of the mind. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. And uh, because we have gone through it, I want you to think. The conscious mind is your thinking mind. It's your educated mind. It's where the intellect is resident. Now, the subconscious mind is your emotional mind. It's the emotional. The conscious mind has the ability to choose. It has the ability to accept or reject, and it has the ability to originate. In other words, if an idea comes into your conscious mind you don't like, you can reject it. And then you can go ahead and originate a new one. The subconscious cannot do that. Your subconscious mind is totally deductive. In other words, it can only accept. It must accept what you give to it, and it has absolutely no ability to reject. Now, here's something about the subconscious mind. This is the only thing you remember from this morning. Your subconscious mind cannot determine what is real and what's imagined. It cannot differentiate between what's actually happening and what you imagine. It takes what you imagine and turns it into reality in your nervous system. It cannot determine the difference between that which is real and that which is imagined. Remember that. Okay? Now, let's take a look here. So here we are here. Let's take that information and we'll take a look. We're getting inundated right now. I don't care where you are in the world, you're getting inundated with terrible news from radio, from uh, TV, from other people. And you have the ability, because you have a reasoning factor that's one of the higher factors, that's what gives you the ability to think. You think, I don't have to accept that. So you could say, get the hell out of here. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. But you know what our problem is? We don't do that. We don't tell it to go away. We just leave it there. Not only do we leave it there, we don't think and we leave our subconscious mind wide open to all that stuff. And that's being dumped right into our emotional mind. And the emotional mind accepts it all as real. Now think about that for a moment. Why do we do it? Paradigm. We're programmed to do it. 
So now the question is, well, how did, where did we get the paradigm? How did we get it? How can we change it? Well, let's close the window on that for a minute. Look over here. That's today. Here we are when we're born. This is how we enter the scene. We arrive on the scene at birth. Our subconscious mind is wide open, and whatever is going on around us goes right in to our subconscious mind. It just keeps dumping in. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of an environment did I grow up in? What was things really like? And you see, that just keeps dumping in there. And I'm going to tell you something. That is where your self-image was first formed. Your self-image was formed by a group of people that were around you that probably knew very, very little about the, uh, about the operation of the mind or how we get results in our life. And that's how your self-image was formed. Now, self-image is just one idea. Now, think of this. Robert Heinlein said, in the absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it. Well, what were the people doing that were surrounding you when you were a baby? Were they really into personal growth or were they just, you know, as he said here, strangely loyal to performing daily trivia? Well, you see, that's how the paradigm is formed. That's where you learn the language that you speak. If you speak more than one language, that's when you learned it. That's where you uh, developed a taste for the food that you eat. Your life was being conformed was being controlled there in your little life. And here you are here years later, that paradigm still controls us. Now, here's the baby, all right? Brand new baby. We'll say that's you. Here's the image for the subconscious mind. That's the graphic we use. So look at that for a moment. There's the graphic of a baby, all right? So we say, here's a brand new baby. Probably somewhere in your family, there is a brand new baby. I know there is in my family. Well, that baby is being inundated with everything that's happening in that baby's environment. It's going right into that baby's subconscious mind, and we become the product of our environment. And that's how the self-image is formed. Then you're going to find that's how the paradigm's formed. And then the conscious mind starts to develop, and we develop our sensory factors. We go by so we hear, see, smell, taste, touch. Now, prior to that, when we're like this, it's just wide open. But now we can start see, hear, smell, taste, touch. So we're surrounded. And that's also our intellectual mind. That's right. And we have these higher faculties, perception, the will, imagination, memory, intuition, and reason. Now, they're all there in the conscious mind, but we're never taught how to use those. We're taught little about them. And then we're sent to school. And we go to school, and the school gives us valuable knowledge. However, school never taught us how to alter the old paradigm. So we frequently don't do what we already know how to do. We have superior knowledge, okay, inferior results, and that causes confusion and frustration. So let's put our model back up there, and there's all the books that we had crammed into our mind. And they gave us tests, they say, yeah, he knows. She knows, they've got it. But isn't it strange, a person's results are nowhere near on the level of their intellect. People know how to do better than they're doing and they're not doing it. Everybody knows how to do better and they're not doing it, why? Why? It's not because we don't know, we do know. Well, it's the paradigm that produces the results. And if we're gonna change those results, we've got to change the paradigm. And if we don't change the paradigm, the results aren't going to change, okay? So, self-image being part of the paradigm, let's take a look at how it happens. The paradigm is a mental program that has almost exclusive control over our habitual behavior, and almost all of our behavior is habitual, okay? Now think of this, cybernetics and paradigms. Cybernetics and paradigms are both Control systems operate essentially on the same principle. Both maintain a definite course of action and will not deviate from the course until that has been established. You must alter the paradigm if you desire to achieve improved results. Both companies and individuals have operating paradigms. So 
Keep that in mind. Here's a thermostat in your house, okay? And the thermostat, I am living in the middle of winter right now. It's cold outside. So we would set the thermostat to control the temperature of the house at 70 degrees. Now, let's suppose I'm sitting in a chair and I'm reading a book. And I'm reading this book, and all of a sudden, I can feel it. my feet are cold. And I notice the room's cold. I go take a look at the thermometer, and I see the temperature has actually dropped to 65 degrees. So what do I do? Well, I'd look around and see what, what's happening. And I notice somebody left the front door open. So I go over and close the door. The thermostat picks up the deviation from the set goal. And it turns on the fire in the furnace. It turns on the fan and it starts to pump air back into the room, warm air, until the temperature of the room is brought back to where the thermostat set it, at 70 degrees. And when it hits the 70 degrees, automatically the fire is turned off, the fan turned off, and we're right back where we started. That all happened automatically. That's happened automatically. You didn't have to do anything. The thermostat does that. There's a cybernetic mechanism in the thermostat. Let's take a look at it a different way. There's an airplane. This has an automatic pilot on a commercial plane, and it's called a, a cybernetic instrument. Now, a flight pattern is programmed into the plane's computer system. When the plane goes off course, the cybernetic system measures the deviation from the set goal and corrects the flight pattern. So here's the plane, it's leaving Chicago, and it's going to uh, Paris. Shortly after it gets out of the vicinity of the uh, O'Hare Airport, it gets hit by some unexpected turbulence. The plane leaves the flight pattern, the cybernetic mechanism picks it up, feeds it back into the coordinating mechanism, and the plane's brought back on course again. That happened automatically. Now that happened the same as the thermostat measured the deviation from the set goal. The pilot doesn't have to do that. That's the automatic pilot that's doing that. That's like uh, Price Pritchett in a, in a book. He said that, that a rocket going to the moon fails its way to the moon. It's correct, 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 correct. It goes off course and brought back on course. Now, let's look at this. There's the conscious and the subconscious. You've got a self-image there. That self-image is controlling your actions and producing your results. That's right. The self-image in your subconscious mind if, um, if I have somebody come to work for me, one of the first things I ask them is, what's the most you've ever earned in a year? Now, I don't care what they've earned, but I want to know what it is, because I want to know where their self-image is. I want to know where their mindset is set. So let's take a look here. Self-image is a cybernetic instrument, okay? Your self-image is controlling your results, okay? It controls the actions which produces the results, okay? Now keep thinking, okay? A person is going to go on a diet and lose weight. They're overweight. So they're going to go on it. They're not going to eat anything white or whatever. They've, they've got the diet. And you know something? They start to lose weight. They start to lose weight. Now, we know what this recognizes by your paradigm. You're going off course. You're going off course. You see, your self-image controlled your weight. And you're going on a diet, you start to lose weight. But your self-image picks up the deviation from the set goal. When a person's overweight goes on a diet without altering the self-image, any weight loss will be temporary. The self-image becomes a cybernetic instrument, measures the deviation from the set goal, immediately corrects course. The weight is, that was lost is found, and they put it back on. Isn't that strange? See, a person will gain and lose tons in their lifetime. Let's suppose, um, here's a key for the studio. Let's suppose you lose the keys for your car. What do you automatically do? You start looking for the keys. You shouldn't lose weight. Release the weight. It's a mental thing, okay? Now, let's look at it in a different way, okay? By the way, there's a good book you want to get, Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. It's a great book on self-image. So let's take a look here now. Here's a child's self-image. And the child is failing miserably in school, okay? 
they're getting very poor grades in school and the child's grounded and made to study. So the kid's got to stay in after school. There's no TV, there's no girls, there's no boys, there's no, you know, anything. Just study, study, study. And you're going to find that they go to school and they have some tests and they start to get better marks on the test. And the teacher sends a note home, Johnny or Betty is doing much better. However, the cybernetic mechanism measures the deviation from the set goal. It feeds it into a coordinating mechanism the person will do whatever is necessary to bring them back on track again. You see? And, and they're down and they're getting the same marks again. So they're up and down, up and down, and up and down. If there's going to be a permanent change, you've got to change inside. You've got to decide what you want, decide what you're prepared to give up to get it, set your mind to it, and then get on with the work. You know that you've got a paradigm. And that paradigm is producing your results. It controls the vibration you're in and produces the results. Now, what you want to do is build with your imagination. You want to build a beautiful new self-image. See yourself exactly the way you want to be. When I say earlier, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. That's the person I want to build. So we go full screen here, Scott. I want you to build an image of exactly how you want to be. And then you plant that image in your subjective mind. That image gets planted in your subconscious mind. And when you do that, it changes the vibration you're in and changes their results. All right. What did you think? First, I'd love to know, is this the first time you've heard Bob teach about self-image or are you hearing it for a second, third, or like me, hundredth time? And is it becoming evident to you what a great role self-image plays in your success? If you look around at your life, every single thing in your life, every result is a result of your self-image, the image you hold of yourself. And so we can't escape our self-image. We can't outperform our self-image. And Bob told me on numerous occasions that this was the most, one of the most impactful lessons he ever learned. And it certainly was for me as well. So I hope that you have come away with an aha and I hope you'll continue to work on your self-image. We have an incredible lesson on self-image and attitude coming up at 12 p.m. Eastern with Araj Basugi and Monica Demarin. You're not going to want to miss it. So if you can, join us live and uh, we'll see you there.